Hi, my name is Rich Hua, and I'm the Global Business Development Manager on the Aurora Database Team at AWS. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of Amazon Aurora Postgres, which I'm proud to say is the fastest growing service in AWS history. To begin, let's look at Aurora architecture at a high level. At its core, Aurora is a Postgres compatible database that has been highly optimized for the cloud. What does that mean? Well, we started by breaking apart the stack and pulling the storage layer out of the database so that each one is its own distinct layer. That allows the database and storage to scale independently from each other. The database and storage layers each has its own monitoring system so that each layer can fail and heal independently. In addition, Aurora is integrated with a host of distributed services, something that we can do seamlessly in the cloud. For example, it leverages foundational services such as S3 for backup, which offers the industry-leading 11.9s of durability, Route 53 for DNS routing, simple workflow service to automate backup tasks, and the time-tested RDS control plane to manage everything. With this architecture, we're able to provide hundreds of thousands of writes per second and millions of reads per second with read replicas. And why are customers interested specifically in Postgres? Well, you likely know some of these reasons already, but I thought I'd share some. Postgres is an open source project that started more than 20 years ago as a follow-on to the Ingress database system by Michael Stonebreaker at UC Berkeley. It is an active and vibrant open source community that continues to innovate with many new features and capabilities. This is partially due to the type of open source license used by Postgres, which allows anyone to modify the source code as needed. In addition, Postgres is not owned or controlled by a single company. It's owned by a nonprofit foundation, which addresses customer concerns about vendor lock -in. From the perspective of functionality, Postgres offers good performance out of the box with transactional semantics very similar to those of Oracle and SQL Server. Postgres is object-oriented and ANSI SQL 2008 compatible, which makes it easy for customers to migrate applications from other relational database platforms. Postgres also supports extensions, which allows you to easily expand its core capabilities in a variety of ways. One of the most powerful and popular is the PostGIS extension which offers very strong support for geospatial use cases. It also supports stored procedures in many languages, including PLPG SQL, which is very similar to Oracle's PL SQL. This combination of features makes Postgres the most Oracle-compatible open source database. We even see that with our own AWS schema conversion tool, with the highest automatic conversion rates from Oracle being to Postgres. Schemas are typically converted in the high 90% range. I'm working with literally hundreds of customers globally who are migrating their Oracle workloads to Postgres. Customers such as Verizon and Dice.com have moved from Oracle to Postgres and are very, very happy with it. One of my favorite migration stories is about a little e-commerce company called Amazon.com. Earlier this year, Amazon migrated 100% of their fulfillment centers off of Oracle and onto Aurora Postgres. And recently, they made it smoothly through Prime Day running fully on the Aurora Postgres platform. One important question customers often ask is, what does Postgres compatibility really mean? Well, it means that Aurora Postgres is 100% wire compatible with community Postgres. This is really important to understand because it means you can take your Postgres database from your laptop, your data center, your colo, or off of EC2 or RDS and drop it right into Aurora Postgres. It also means you can easily leave any time. You're not locked in in any way. In creating Aurora Postgres, we took Postgres code, and integrated Aurora's cloud-optimized storage into the lower layers. Aurora Storage maintains six copies of every write across three availability zones for high durability. It supports up to 15 read replicas with very little replica lag. Generally, it's in a single digit milliseconds. And it provides failover times of 30 seconds or less. In terms of performance, we see three times or better performance in terms of write throughput when compared to standard Postgres on standard benchmarks. To get a better understanding of Aurora, I find it's useful to compare it to a traditional architecture. So let's look at how RDS Postgres in a multi-availability zone system works. That is the picture on the left-hand side. You have one primary and a synchronous secondary. Each database instance has its own disk, and that disk is mirrored for redundancy. So four copies of the data are stored across two availability zones. This works great and helps us run the largest fleet of Postgres databases in the world with very high availability and durability. However, because this uses the monolithic traditional database stack, even in the AWS cloud, you can only take this so far. That's why we did things differently in Aurora, which is on the right-hand side. You can immediately see that the architecture is different. There's one primary database, the writer, 
and then multiple read replicas, and the replicas all share a distributed storage system with the primary, rather than managing their own storage. And in terms of the data, it is written six times across three availability zones by default. Now let's dive deeper into how Aurora works. As I just mentioned, Aurora storage duplicates data six times across three AZs, and data is continually backed up to S3. There are no backup windows, no performance impact during backup because of that. The system has a separate monitoring management layer you'll never see as a customer. To you, the database just keeps on running. One powerful aspect of Aurora is that it uses a quorum algorithm for writes. When a transaction comes into the database instance, it sends the logs asynchronously to all six storage nodes. And as soon as four out of the six acknowledge the transaction is durable, the system commits the transaction. So this means that lagging disks or nodes or even entire availability zones can be written through by the system with little or no impact on performance. In fact, an entire AZ can go down and the Aurora cluster will just keep on running. As long as four storage nodes are available, it keeps on writing. Another key benefit of a quorum-based system is that nodes can leave and join the system as they're upgraded or repaired and there's no performance or availability impact. One final benefit is that the storage grows automatically in 10 gig increments as the database size grows, up to 64 terabytes. There's no need to worry about pre-provisioning or running out of storage. Many customers have told me what a big relief it has been to not have to manage storage anymore. Now, one thing to note is that the storage nodes are not actually six physical storage servers. They consist of hundreds and in some cases thousands of i3 instances that have their own compute, memory, and very fast NVMe SSDs. They're IO optimized. We abstract that fleet of i3 instances into the six storage nodes and present them to you as the Aurora storage subsystem. Thus, if an i3 goes bad, it's easy to replace in the background. Or if data size grows, we can just add more i3 instances. So you can see that it's quite a robust architecture that's being managed by Aurora in the background. Now let's talk about the database layer. Just like in the storage layer, there's a separate monitoring and repair system, one you'll never see as a customer. At any time, Aurora provides one primary writable database node and up to 15 read-only replicas. These nodes are monitored and replaced automatically and transparently. Not only that, the system detects any failing database processes and recycles them as needed. Now, the read replicas in Aurora actually serve two functions. First, they help with query offloading, as their name implies. And second, they act as failover targets in case the primary goes down. Now, let's first talk about query offloading. Because of optimizations we've made, these read replicas typically lag the master by less than 10 milliseconds. Notice I said milliseconds, not seconds. This allows you to scale out your read load as well as direct workloads to specific read replicas for different applications. Aurora provides a reader endpoint which treats all the readers as a pool. And it will automatically load balance the read workload with DNS round robin. You also have the ability to specify your own custom endpoint and include any subset of the readers in that. For example, if you have five total read replicas, you may want to subset three of them for a specific DI application. And you can do that with a custom endpoint. You also have the option to set your replicas to auto scale. And Aurora will add and delete replicas as the read traffic increases and decreases. Now let's talk about how the read replicas offer high availability. They do this by serving as failover targets. If the primary instance were to go down, it would be automatically detected and a failover would occur in 30 seconds or less. You have the ability to specify the failover order. So you can choose the most appropriate read replica as tier zero, then tier one, then tier two, and so forth. Note that this happens transparent to the application. The application connects to the primary database instance via what we call the cluster endpoint. And that endpoint always points to the primary. So when a failover occurs, we modify the cluster endpoint so that it points at the newly promoted primary. To help make failovers even smoother, you can also leverage a feature called cluster cache management, which keeps the cache of a replica in sync with the primary's cache. That way, when a failover occurs, the cache of the new primary that was just newly promoted is already warm, so the brownout period is greatly reduced, and the app is running at full speed very quickly. Now, a final note is that we do recommend that customers have at least one read replica if they want failovers in 30 seconds or less. Without one, if the primary were to fail, a new database instance would need to be instantiated, and that would take a few minutes. So that's how we achieve high availability in a row. Now let's dive deeper into performance. In order to provide higher performance, we do a few things differently in Aurora. First, we only write log records, not blocks. Second, we batch those records together with what we call a boxcar technique. 
Thus, we're actually shipping a set of log records at a time, shuffling it to appropriate segments, and then box powering again into buckets for storage mode. In this way, we get a lot more efficiency out of the network. And because the storage system is transaction aware, it doesn't acknowledge just individual writes, it actually acknowledges groups of transactions. So by only writing log records and packing commits together, even though we do six times more logical writes than a typical monolithic database, we actually generate nine times less network traffic. And with the four out of six write form, we can not only reduce IO, but network jitter as well. These are reasons Aurora can offer three times or better throughput than standard Postgres. Now let's look at one more key reason. Remember that storage is intelligent with its own compute and memory and SSD? Well, because of that, we can use the storage nodes to offload some of the operations from the database. This slide is really busy, so I don't expect you to read the whole thing. But the key point is that only operations one and two block the database. That entails receiving a batch of log records from the database, persisting it in log form to a local SSD, and then acknowledging it back. The rest of the operations, number three through eight, happen asynchronously in the background and don't affect database performance at all. Things such as coalescing logs into data blocks, backing up into S3, gossiping with other storage nodes, garbage collection, and verification checks on the storage. So as you can see, there are some really nice benefits to having intelligent storage nodes in Aurora. Now, let's look at the results of a particular benchmark. This is from a sysbench test comparing standard Postgres and RDS with Aurora Postgres. Standard Postgres is the blue line along the bottom, and Aurora Postgres is the orange line along the top. Now, it's obvious that Aurora provides higher performance across the board in this particular benchmark. If you take a closer look, you'll see something interesting. As the number of client connections grows, the performance multiple of Aurora actually increases as well. At lower client counts, Aurora is about two times better performing, but at higher client counts, Aurora is actually over five times better. The fact is, highly concurrent workloads is where Aurora really shines. The more users that hit the database, the better Aurora does in comparison to a standard database. One caveat, of course, is that this is just a benchmark, so results will vary depending on your workload. I encourage you to do a POC of Aurora with your actual workload to get a real idea of how it will perform for you. Another thing I want to call out about Aurora is that it does backups very differently from traditional databases. The main difference is that there are no checkpoints. Aurora continually backs up into S3 in a parallel, asynchronous, and distributed manner. Because there are no checkpoints, there's absolutely no performance impact for backup operations. There's also a significant difference when doing crash recovery. On the left, you see how a traditional database does this. It has to load the checkpointed data and then apply all the log records since the last checkpoint, which could be up to five minutes ago. In a large running system, this can be a lot of records. And recovery, which is often single-threaded, can take even longer than the original transactions took to run. In contrast, on the right, you see how Aurora recovers from a crash. Early in the Amazon Aurora design, we had the concept that a log-based storage system could recover more quickly. And so that's what we built. Because the system is transaction aware and constantly applying logs and coalescing blocks, recovery from a primary node crash and restart is really a matter of setting what transaction ID you'd like the system to be visible at. The result is that it's orders of magnitude faster. Instead of minutes, it's just a few seconds. Here's a graph that shows the difference in crash recovery times. The blue circles on the left are for a traditional database system. As you know, there's always a trade-off between recovery time and performance, depending on the redo size. With a 3 gig redo, we recovered in 19 seconds. The writes were about 18,000 per second. With a much larger 30 gig redo, performance was a lot better at over 40,000 writes per second, but it took 123 seconds to recover. With Aurora, it's totally different. It's represented by that little orange dot way over on the right-hand side. It recovered in three seconds. It was immediately up to full speed, pushing 135,000 writes per second, because it has no redo. In the end, recovery time is reduced by up to 97% with Aurora, compared to traditional Postgres systems. Now let's talk about a few more of the advanced features that Aurora offers. First, there's Performance Insights which lets it go beyond infrastructure and OS level metrics that you may get from CloudWatch and enhanced monitoring. PI, or Performance Insights, actually guides discovery performance issues. You can select from hundreds of metrics and drill down into the granular details of what is impacting the database performance. One key metric is database load, which makes performance bottlenecks really stand out. 
We can view the load by various dimensions, such as wait events, SQL, hosts, and users. This is a tool that customers love. And I've heard a lot of great feedback about it. What's really nice is that it's totally free to use and retains seven days of metrics for free as well. Now you have the option of keeping them for longer, up to two years, by just paying a little bit for storage. Another really useful feature is fast database cloning. With this feature, you can create clones in a minute or two versus having to do a full snapshot restore. It creates a new cluster with a storage that is just pointers to the primary, so no data needs to be copied. It uses copy on write technology so that the clone only needs to store new writes or the deltas. You can create up to 15 clones of a database, and you can also clone across accounts. So if your production and dev test environments are different accounts, that's easily taken care of. Customers have found that it's great for creating dev test instances or instances for doing benchmarks. It's also great for long running queries. For example, if you have a query that needs to run for 30 minutes, you can create a fast clone, hit that clone with your query, and then toss away when you're done. That way it won't have any impact on the performance of the primary database cluster. Now let's talk about Aurora Serverless. This is a new feature that customers are really excited about. Serverless gives you the ability to automatically scale your databases up and down based on your workload characteristics. There's no more need to monitor and manually change instance sizes. The way serverless works is that the applications connect to a proxy layer that has a warm pool of instances of different sizes underneath it. When the workload requirements go up, for example, because memory or compute requirements go above a certain threshold, serverless will switch to a larger instance size. And when they go down, it switches to a smaller one. You just set a min and a max number of ACUs, which stands for Aurora Capacity Units, and the serverless cluster will automatically adjust the instance size within those parameters. One nice option is that you can set your min ACU to zero, which essentially puts the database into a hibernating state. This is great for dev test environments, where it goes down to zero in the evenings and on weekends when no one's working on it. Other good use cases include infrequently used applications, for example, low volume blog sites, applications with variable load with peaks of activity that are hard to predict, for instance, news sites, and consolidated fleets of multi-tenant SaaS applications. Now, one note is that serverless is not a panacea for all use cases. There is a little bit of a pause, about two to three seconds, as it switches instance sizes from one to another, so the application does need to be able to withstand that. I always encourage customers to test it out to see if it's a fit for their particular workload. That being said, serverless is gaining rapid adoption from customers of all sizes globally. Finally, here are some features that are coming soon to an Aurora database near you. The first is Global Database. This enables you to do cross-region replication and create read replicas in different regions around the world. It brings data closer to your customers' applications in different geographies. It's also great for supporting a warm DR strategy. What's nice is that replication is done on the Aurora storage tier, so it provides high throughput with low latency. In real-world tests, we've seen the latency to be well under one second between any two regions in the world and throughput of up to 200,000 writes per second with negligible impact. The next one is Data API. This allows you to connect to Aurora Serverless via an HTTP interface without using a client-side driver. Great for the fast and rapidly proliferating number of IoT and mobile devices in the world. The next one is Backtrack. This is like a rewind button for your database instance. It's for those cases where someone accidentally drops a table or does a delete without where clause. Instead of having to do a full point time restore, which can take a while, you can go back in time in a matter of seconds. The next one is Aurora Parallel Query. Of course, we all know that Postgres already has a parallel query feature, but this is somewhat different. It's actually the Aurora version of Parallel Query on the storage tier. This feature will enable you to push down the predicates into the intelligent storage layer and greatly increase the speed of many of your queries. In real life tests, we've seen gains of 10x to 100x for queries. And much more. Stay tuned for more features coming to Aurora Postgres. We are constantly innovating and hard at work to provide customers like you with what you need from an enterprise grade relational database system. Thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about Amazon Aurora Postgres. I really hope it was helpful to you. For more details, please go to the AWS Aurora Postgres page noted on this slide. I hope you get the chance to experience the benefits of Aurora in the very near future. Again, this is Rich Hua, Global Business Development Manager for Aurora from AWS, signing off.